Hello, I'm Ben Tuman, and welcome to Skipped History. Spring is here, my hat is gone, but it's still time to get down to business. Today's story is about the 1965 military coup in Indonesia. I read about it in The Shock Doctrine by Naomi Klein and The Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevins. To start, I'd like to discuss the Berkeley Mafia. And I don't mean the notorious goon squad who'll roast you on Twitter if they catch you sipping an unfair trade macchiato. No, I mean a group of Indonesians who studied at the University of Berkeley in the 1950s and who became known as the Berkeley Mafia. While most of the curriculum at the time focused on how to recycle and ostracize family members who use styrofoam, what is wrong with you? Seriously. Berkeley also had a conservative pro-business economics department that instructed the young mafia members. Afterward, they returned home to build a similar style economics program at the University of Indonesia, where they soon began to develop economic contingency plans, just in case Indonesia's president, Sukarno, happened to lose his grip on power. And you'll never believe this, but with the CIA's help, Sukarno's government did suddenly fall in 1965, and the Berkeley Mafia's contingency plans laid an economic blueprint still in place to this day. To see what I mean, and I should warn you, this is a violent story. Let's rewind to 1958, when as we saw in the first episode of Skipped History this season, the Dulles brothers led the US's first attempt to overthrow Sukarno. Their plan, which included equipping the Indonesian military in the hopes that it would turn against Sukarno, didn't work out so well. However, thanks to the JFK and LBJ administration's continued financial support, the Indonesian military emerged as a potent political force and acted as a right-wing counterbalance to Sukarno, whom U.S. officials detested for his continued tolerance of Indonesia's Communist Party, called the PKI. What did the U.S. government have against the PKI? Well, the PKI had some pretty concerning political goals. For example, they were committed to nonviolence, union organization, women's rights, and had a stated goal of maybe implementing socialism by the end of the century, which is to say, on the same timeline as New York State's for completing construction on the bridge behind me. Of course, there was another reason U.S. officials remained eager to topple Sukarno. After surviving the events of 1958, he reduced the power of multinational corporations by, for example, rewriting the country's oil regulations to make them more favorable to Indonesians. In response, LBJ's Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who, by the way, also studied at the University of Berkeley, led a push to curtail foreign aid to Indonesia, which soon sent the country's economy into a tailspin. Sukarno replied that if U.S. officials wanted to attach political demands to their aid, then they could, as he said, go to hell with your aid, which didn't exactly improve his standing with the U.S. government. Indeed, declassified documents show that the CIA received high-level directions to liquidate President Sukarno depending on the situation and available opportunities. That opportunity came in October 1965 when an Indonesian general named Suharto began the process of seizing power and eradicating the left. At the time, most Indonesians hadn't heard of Suharto, a taciturn 44-year-old army general, but the CIA had, describing him in a secret cable in 1964 as one of the generals most friendly to U.S. interests. That assessment proved correct. When provided with shooting lists by the CIA, Suharto sent out soldiers to kill four to 5,000 members of the PKI. Meanwhile, the U.S. Embassy received regular reports on the troops' progress, with U.S. Ambassador to Indonesia Marshall Green declaring his increasing respect for the Army's determination and organization in carrying out this crucial assignment. And as another person who worked at the Embassy at the time added, the Army probably killed a lot of people, and I probably have a lot of blood on my hands, but that's not all bad. That's not? What percent bad is it? And what accounts for it being under 100%? Did you get a free Google Home? Did they put friends back on Netflix? Was Jesus reincarnated and it turns out he was just Javier Bardem as I suspected all along? Because even with all those things, that's still 100% bad. So Suharto excelled at eradicating the left, but he had no idea what to do about Indonesia's deteriorating economy. Enter the Berkeley Mafia, who surprise, surprise, had worked with the military in drafting their contingency plans and developed enormous sway over Suharto. According to one member of the Berkeley Mafia, they provided Suharto with a cookbook of recipes for dealing with Indonesia's serious economic problems, which included classics like business privatization a frutti di mare and how to let other countries steal our resources scalapini. 
According to Fortune magazine, the Berkeley Mafia even provided Suharto with audio tapes of economics lessons that he could listen to at home, which went something like this. Pennies in my pockets, nickels and dimes. I can hear the money in this pocket of mine. Little ones, big ones, silver and brown. Anyway, by March 10th, 1966, the army was firmly in control of Indonesia and Sukarno fled the country. Within days, Suharto arrested Sukarno's remaining cabinet members and replaced them with members of the Berkeley Mafia, who soon passed legislation allowing foreign companies to own 100% of Indonesia's oil and mineral wealth. Companies based in the U.S. have controlled and operated Indonesia's largest oil fields and gold mines ever since. In March 1966, Suharto also banned the PKI. That is, what was left of them. And this is where things get really violent. Dating back to when the coup began in October 1965, there had been a steady stream of politically motivated killings. In fact, after the Indonesian military completed the CIA's shooting lists, they trained religious students to sweep the countryside of communists. Those sweeps led to the deaths of an estimated 500,000 to 1 million people, virtually none of them guilty of any crime other than being on the wrong side of a CIA-backed coup. A tribunal later assembled in the Netherlands found the Indonesian military guilty of a litany of war crimes, all carried out to prop up a dictatorial violent regime with assistance from the US, UK, and Australia. And as tragic, gruesome, and unfathomable as these events are from a humanitarian perspective, from the CIA's perspective, the coup was a success. The fact that their strategy entrenched US business interests and a radical anti-communist regime meant it would be repeated again and again, as a high-ranking CIA official at the time stated. And he was right. Over the ensuing decades, US-backed anti-communist extermination programs occurred all over the world, some of which maybe we'll explore in future episodes if I'm not busy authoring a cookbook called The Joy of Duping People Into Thinking Skipped History is a Comedy Show. But in sum, Hundreds of millions of people continue to live in countries shaped by bloody events that can all be traced, as the same CIA official said, to the way Suharto came to power. And that includes the U.S., because eventually the citizens carrying out these horrific events abroad have to return home, and their radical, anti-communist beliefs don't just fade away. Tune in next time to learn more about that bit of Skipta Historia Aymare.